Hello and welcome everyone, and thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Caitlin Woods, and I am a project agent for the Hire for Talent project at the Rustfish CBDC in Campbellton, New Brunswick. I am joining you today from the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq First Nations on which we are learning and working. Join with me as Marco Pasca, an award-winning entrepreneur, accessibility consultant, and an inspirational speaker with cerebral palsy. An, accessib an accessibility and inclusion consultant, he has worked with many business leaders who are champions for more accessible, inclusive workplaces. Um, without getting into too much detail, Marco and I will be discussing why employers should, be, should consider hiring inclusively. I want to also thank you, Marco, for taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with us today about these topics that are so important for the future of businesses. So without further ado, let's jump right into the interview. So Marco, in your experience, what benefits have employers seen when hiring inclusively? Well, first and foremost, Caitlin, I just want to say thank you so much to you and the team for, for having me come out today and uh, to speak to my experience. Uh, for those of you who can't necessarily tell or don't know me personally, um, I, as you heard, have cerebral palsy. But how that have impacts me is that I am a wheelchair user, a manual wheelchair user. I've got my trusty wheelchair right here beside me. Um, and, um, and so this is why as an accessibility consultant and speaker, uh, this subject matter is so, so important to me. Um, you know, it's interesting in my work, Caitlin, as a consultant, I get asked the question all the time about what are the benefits for hiring inclusively? And, you know, for me, I find it kind of an interesting question because my whole thing is like, why wouldn't you hire inclusively? Like, are you going out of your way to make a plan to not hire um, people of all abilities and all uh, in all shapes and sizes, right? For me, it's always about hiring the right person for the right role, right? So we're not talking about affirmative action here in saying that, you know, you have to um, go out of your way to, to almost um, cheerlead the idea of, oh, we hire persons with disabilities because, Disabilities aren't always visible. You can't always tell that somebody has a disability. There's lots of invisible disabilities. Um, before we uh, went on live today, you and I were talking about the prevalence uh, of mental health challenges, particularly um, you know, due to the pandemic right now and how we're all kind of working from home and how mental health can impact us as well. And so although individuals from the invisible disability community might not identify as having a disability when they have anxiety and depression, autism, ADHD, you know, this is definitely something that is going to impact a, a person, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have the skills and abilities to add to your team, um, particularly right now in, in a period of labor shortages. Um, I always say that there's an untapped talent pool of persons with disabilities. And the reason I say it's untapped is that I don't think that traditional employers have largely considered persons with disabilities as a viable sort of market of people to approach. Um, but yet having a disability isn't just that uh, accessibility symbol with an with a, with a androgynous person in a wheelchair pushing forward. You know, it's so much more than that, right? As we've mentioned. And I, I think that I can at least say this for myself. As a person with a disability my entire life, I was born with cerebral palsy, which is brain damage at birth. When I tell people that, they go, wait, you have brain damage? You don't seem like you have brain damage. You talk perfectly fine. See, there you go. That's a stigma, right? Uh, our brain controls every aspect of our body. And so my brain may not affect my ability to speak. It may not affect my cognitive ability, but it does impact my ability to walk. But having said that, I don't necessarily need to walk in the traditional fashion to do every single kind of job out there. So the reason I say that people with disabilities are primed um, to join your team, especially in a labor shortage, is many people with disabilities have had to adapt to challenging situations their entire life. This is totally pre-COVID, you know? Um, and the way in which persons with disabilities, many of which uh, approach challenges, really plays a part in the things that they've experienced in their own lives. And that same attitude and that same approach can be applied whether you work in a boardroom or whether you're working in blue collar labor work. Uh, didn't you mention uh, before we got on the call that your husband, uh, he owns a business as a, as a fabricator or a welder? Yes, yes. He owns a welding and fabrication business in our, in our region here, yes. Yeah. 
So I'm sure that throughout COVID now, uh, you know, there's been obviously a, a major impact in all industries. I'm sure that he's looking for uh, laborers or people that could do the work. Do you think that there's any reason why somebody who even utilizes a wheelchair couldn't necessarily join his team as long as they had the appropriate training? No, 100%. I think, I think somebody as easily who would have a wheelchair could be easily accommodated at his, his business. Um, and I think a lot of people would fit the job perfectly. Yeah, absolutely. And then that's not even including individuals who are on the autism spectrum or, or potentially see things a little bit differently. Even somebody with anxiety and depression, I, I don't want people to feel as though mental health is a lost cause in the sense of workplace because people think, oh, it's going to be time away from work. That person um, isn't necessarily going to interact well in group environments. That's absolutely not true. What it comes down to is how we create a workplace environment that fosters um, bringing out the most out of all the people, right? All the people that we work with, they create that sort of environment um, and that culture that we have within our organization. And workplace culture is such a buzzword. I think people think that it has to do with large conglomerates or corporations, but you can have a small or medium-sized business and you still have workplace culture. It's how you set the tone, right? Um, in my experience, pe people with disabilities that I've worked with outside of my own disability, there has been increased productivity from those who identify with having the disability um, simply because in many cases, you might be approaching somebody who for the first time in their life, you're the first employer to give them a shot or an opportunity. And the one thing I've actually noticed that's a huge benefit during the pandemic, if we want to highlight uh, silver linings, is that um, remote work has really shown some employers the abilities that you're able to unlock in other people simply by giving them the opportunity to showcase the talents that they do have and not necessarily the challenges that may be presented as a result of a disability. So as long as their home office is set up to, in order to do the job that they're expected to do, or if they have a more labor intensive job, if it comes down to you being able to schedule out the things or some people like lists or breakdowns of what it is that they're expected to do in order to ease the anxiety that they're feeling, so what? Let's create those lists. Let's break that down. If all it is is being able to create a list of 10 things that that person has to recall or remember, but if you do that, they're going to be able to go through those items one by one and do them the best that you could ever expect, then you're really missing an opportunity of not unlocking that within people, right? Yes, I agree 100%. And just on the mental health thing, I'm sure most of us here today have some sort of mental health, whether it's anxiety, depression, yes. you're, we're either going through it or we've been through it or we're going to go through it. So I think mm -hmm. that's another thing that we can't be scared of in, in workplace settings. And as employers, I think they, they maybe need to like realize these things that it's not a big deal that somebody might have a mental illness and they can mm -hmm. still do the work that is needed to be done. Well, you know, and that's the thing too, right? I mean, when we say mental illness, I think people get um, another stigma in their mind of what that looks like, or, or they place assumptions on people what that looks like. For the longest time as a speaker, so outside of my work as a consultant, I also am an inspirational speaker. And I never opened up about the fact that I've struggled with mental health and anxiety issues for over 20 years. It was only up to the last three to four years when I started to work with these workplaces the reason I never opened up about it, Caitlin, before is that I thought that people were going to think that I was a fraud, you know, working as a person who inspires other people. And then all of a sudden, oh, I'm letting them know, by the way, you know, behind closed doors, I struggle too. But what I realized is that the workplaces that were the most successful are the ones that own up to the strengths and all the elements that make up each individual employee and understanding that sometimes those things that we have self-perception on as negative things can actually be used as positive things on how we apply ourselves in the workplace. But it comes down to feeling comfortable enough to open yourself up to being authentic in your workplace. And people don't do that because they're afraid that they're going to get fired if they explain that they have have some sort of mental health challenge, um, that they need um, a different work schedule, perhaps. Maybe instead of starting at 9 a.m., they start at 10 or 11 a.m. because of family life or because it takes them a while to get started. Whatever the case may be, there are so many benefits to hiring people of all abilities. I mean, I we could spend an hour just talking about that in and of itself, but I can tell you, I personally have seen um, the impact 
within other companies that I've not only worked with, but also uh, read about around the world when it comes to hiring more inclusively. For example, there's a, a Tim Hortons uh, franchise owner. Now, I'm not sure how many franchise, uh, franchises he still owns today, um, but his name's Mark Wafer, and he's out of Ontario. And I don't know if you've heard of Mark Wafer or any of the work that he does, but Mark Wafer is a business leader um, who happens to um, have hearing loss. Um, and I actually believe that he classifies himself as uh, traditionally deaf. Um, now, Mark, he obviously Tim Hortons as Canadians, we know that's a very huge brand and he wanted to recognize the fact that he as a deaf um, business owner wanted to unlock the potential in other employees and he was recognizing that other business leaders weren't activating on that. And so some of the adjustments that I saw Mark do, I, I've met Mark in person, but I've also seen stories done on him on CBC and uh, you know across the, uh, across the globe. But one of the things he did was he wanted to hire more people that were reflective of himself, his experiences, and his community. And so he did hire some deaf employees to work with him at his Tim Hortons. Now, when an order comes up at Tim Hortons, there's often, I don't know because I don't work there, but there's like bells that go that you have to know that the bell's gone off and now your order's up and, you know, you have certain time frames to make it in, in the restaurant industry. Well, one way to resolve the fact that that's an audio cue that, that Mark would have to deal with all he did was install, I believe, a red light that at the same time as the audio cue is going off, a red light turns on to give that indication that, oh, the order is due up. Now, right there is a, you know, less than a dollar solution to buy a brand new bulb, or, you know, and have that trigger with the sound. But what he's doing is he's unlocking the talents of the people and he's giving the opportunity for a person uh, who is deaf or has other challenges to work with him on his team. And there's no reason why that person couldn't. In fact, I don't think he's the only one who spoke to the fact that people with different disabilities actually are able to focus and hone in more. So his deaf employee or employees have been able to be much more laser focused about creating their orders and getting them out because there isn't that back and forth banter or chatter going on and they're not necessarily distracted by the kitchen noises and things like that. A another really cool example is with a business leader of a small uh, and medium-sized business here um, in the lower mainland called Gabby and Jules. It's a pie shop, and this is not like me just plugging them, but they are delicious. Now, um, the loan owner, uh, Lisa Beecroft, her daughter, I believe it's Gabriella, is on the spectrum. And so Lisa wanted to create an environment where her daughter could feel as though she could move into management and eventually run um, the cafe at one point. And at one point uh, at their peak, uh, pre-COVID, I believe they had as much as 30 to 50% of their staff on the spectrum. And it's because Lisa uh, kind of let me know that she was noticing that her employees on the spectrum were actually able to learn the patterns of cutting out the pie shapes and the pie crust and whatever, and do that in ways that were, uh, you know, laser focused in, in ways that they're their typical colleagues weren't able to do. And it almost becomes competitive in that way. So it's interesting to me that they found uh, employees on the spectrum. And instead of approaching it as, oh, that's going to be a challenge, they said, well, how can actually we unlock um, your disability actually as an advantage for you in this workplace? And I think that that can be used as a blueprint from any business owner, whether you're in a Fortune 500 large company or you're in a small business where you can say, what is it about the labor market around me? How can I reflect my community better? And what can I do to meet the needs of all employees so that we're actually helping them to get 100% productivity of who they are and what they're capable of? Yes, 100%. That is excellent. And it's funny because I was just about to ask you that question, but you, you actually just answered it for me. Um, <laughs> I'm just kind of curious. Um, sure. What would you say to an employer who is afraid um, to maybe start their hiring inclusive practice? Yeah, I mean, honestly, there's nothing to be afraid of. In fact, we have nothing to lose. We've already covered the fact that right now we're in a labor shortage. This is the perfect opportunity now um, as we're going through the pandemic, we've learned so many different ways in which we can operate our businesses 
um, that we weren't exposed to before. I'll, I'll let you in on something uh, for myself and my own business. As a, as a speaker, I was so used to traveling the country and the globe, um, you know, week in and week out where I was more on a plane than I was at home. And when the pandemic first hit, I was hit like a ton of bricks in that, what am I going to do now with my business in that I'm so used to traveling, so used to being in person. And I have to be honest, I was afraid. I was scared. I was scared to pivot. I was scared because I hadn't necessarily predicted that a pandemic was coming down the line and that I would have to completely adjust the way that I did things. And I lost out on a ton of potential income right at the beginning because nobody knew how long this was going to last. But I had a choice in that moment. I could choose to stay stagnant and say, well, I'm going to let my fears consume me and just sit here in a corner and say, I don't know what to do for the next several months. Or I could start to adapt and change and change my business plan in such a way where I could amp myself up and still provide the same services that I provide just differently. So what did I do? I went out and bought a 4K uh, web camera. I bought a better microphone setup. I um, started promoting myself as somebody that could do these types of presentations remotely, even though I feed off of the energy of the people that I work with. And as far as accessibility consulting and reviewing blueprints, what's to say that I can't review blueprints over a computer and still di dialogue within management teams and do these things? So that's just a small example that within myself, I was able to make an adjustment within my own workplace, within my own office make do with what I had and recognize, well, wait a minute, are there gaps within my company or the gaps within the way in which I'm doing things that I could improve upon my process and actually not only improve upon it, but make it better. And I kid you not to all the employers that are out there, because I made those adjustments, my October, November, and December of last year were my most successful business year, uh, months in the 10 years that I've run my company all because I didn't stay stagnant with what I thought my business needed to be. I've always said that a business is like raising a, a human being. It, it is organic. You have to listen to its needs, its wants, and its desires. If we stay stubborn in the way in which we run our companies, then our companies will potentially take us down with the ship if we're not able to adapt and adjust quickly. However, if you recognize and you have your finger to the pulse on what is current within your industry. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter if you're a speaker or not, or if you're in fabrication or whatever it is that you do. What can you do to pivot in order to meet the needs of your customer base while also adjusting so that you don't necessarily have to shut down? Um, there's a local theater here in British Columbia called the, the Rio Theater. And um, uh, because of certain restrictions, theaters weren't being able to be open at the time during COVID. What the business owner did was they recognized that sports bars um, and, and places that were serving drinks were still able to be open. So she recognized that. And instead of saying, oh my goodness, we have to shutter our doors, they were already serving alcoholic drinks and things like this. So they pivoted the business slightly to call it a sports bar theater. They cut down the theater component of things, but they allowed it to have social distancing seating available within the theater and able to still serve alcohol simply by pivoting to more of a sports bar approach. That fit within the guidelines that our particular province was looking for. And it meant that she didn't have to come completely shut her doors as a result of the pandemic. So it does take a little craftiness for you to think outside of the box sometimes, but I truly think that it's a huge win for any entrepreneur to say, wait a minute, is there an opportunity for me to unlock things within my own business? And hey, if you're not an entrepreneur and you're working for another company, you can still apply these skill sets and these strategies, even if you're not in a leadership position. If you are in a leadership position, even better. If you're not, Talk to your team members. Say, what can we do differently? What can we do to pivot and meet the needs of our community? And you'll be surprised at the results. Wow, Marco. Thank you so much for sharing your experience on this topic, but we do have to start wrapping it up. Okay. Um, do you have any final words before jumping into the Q&A period? My, my biggest final word, and I am going to give a shout out to you guys, is going to the Hire for Talent website. The Hire for Talent website is incredible. Um, I believe you do have um, some funding through the government of Canada, which is fantastic. And, um, and I'm really thrilled to say that some of the documents that I've created around providing accommodations, they are going to be available up on the website, um, you know, in a couple of months as well. And the cool thing about the Hire for Talent website is it's 
you know, H I R E uh, for talent, uh, F O R talent. Uh, Uh, .ca. Uh, And basically you go to hire for talent, you can look up a a wide variety of different topics, whether if it is just this introductory sort of getting started topic, or you want to go into things like recruitment, which we are going to be covering, by the way, at future webinars. This is only one of five webinars that we plan on doing one, one each month. Um, So make sure to tune in. Uh, But yeah, go over to Hire for Talent. Take a look. The resources are free. They're provided to you. Um, And this is really a way for you to download these PDFs and learn how to get started. And uh, I believe our next webinar is on uh, February 15th. And we're going to be talking specifically at that point about inclusive job postings. So we've just talked about why the benefits of being inclusive. And now how do you create or craft a job posting that is then going to cater to attracting that audience? audience of that untapped talent pool. So that would be my my final uh, kind of plug there. So Marco, thank you so much for your time today. And again, if anybody has any questions, um, you can do info at hireforTalent.ca as well. And you can also visit our website at hireforTalent.ca.